You Are What You Eat, Part 1, The Deep Roots of Food Culture. You are what you eat. It's a saying we all know, but we underestimate the extent to which it's true, especially from a historical perspective. Moreover, if we tweak the phrase slightly, we can get all kind of different interpretations about the role of food in today's culture and historical cultures. You are what you eat is literally true. The things we eat drink and breathe make up most of our body. And this simple observation that you are what you eat has spawned a variety of creation stories about the origin of humans. For instance, maize constituted the major part of the ancient Mayan diet. So it wouldn't be surprising if they believed that they were made by the gods using maize. Maze. And, and, and indeed, that is what they believe. So some of their myths have it where the gods first tried making man out of mud, but they didn't like it. They were not satisfied with the product. Then the gods tried making man out of wood. Again, they didn't like what they found, but finally when they made man out of maize, they liked what they saw and they said, this is our creation, we're going to keep it. And the funny thing is, the ancient Mayan belief that we're made of maize is really in many ways true, especially for Americans. I say that because for every 100 atoms of carbon in your body, if you're a typical American, 69 of those atoms came from maize. And little of this comes from direct consumption of maize or corn. Most of it comes from the byproducts of maize that's in processed foods. But but a lot of it also from the meat, eggs, and dairy that we consume since cows, pigs, and chickens are all fed diets heavy in maize. Since most of our food comes from plants, or all of it directly or indirectly comes from plants, and plants come from the earth, you might think that some creation stories have humans being made from the earth. And indeed, that is what we find. For instance, stories from ancient Sumer said man was created when a goddess made the form of man out of mud and placed that sculpture into her womb and then gave birth to man. The ancient Greeks believed that Prometheus molded the shape of man out of mud. You see this mud thing a lot. And then it became human when the goddess Athena came by and endowed it with the soul and the god Eros breathed the spirit of life into it. And of course the Christian Bible states that man was created from the dust of the ground. If you're a Christian, please don't hold against me that I put some stuff from Christianity along with things that you, you would call myth. I'm just looking at everything from a historical perspective. Well, if you are what you eat, you want to be careful about what you eat, right? Let's look at how some familiar religions viewed food in the past. Out of Eden. For Jews and Christians and in many ways, Human creatures are fallen from grace. You know, the, the Christian Bible has man starting off, the first two humans being Adam and Eve, in the Garden of Eden. And we're no longer there. We're in a sinful world. So you might think that the, the food we eat compared to the Garden of Eden is somewhat sinful. And that is the case from a historical perspective. If you look at the, the book of Genesis and you look what Adam and Eve ate, you'll see that they were definitely vegetarians, and they may have only eaten fruits and nuts. Let me read you a part from the Bible. Genesis verse 1, 29 through 30. Then God said to Adam, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth, and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth, and all the birds of the air, and all the creatures that move on the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. Now, you look there and it seems like humans are eating mostly just seeds and nuts. And that might be because if you're in paradise, there shouldn't be any death in paradise, right? Well, if you eat a whole lettuce, you're killing that plant. But if you just take seeds from a plant or fruit from a tree, you're not killing the plant. So Adam and Eve may have only eaten things like seeds and nuts so that there would be no killing of any plant, even plants in paradise. But another interpretation says that Adam and Eve could have eaten vegetables as well. I, I, I mean, after all, the God did give the beast of the earth every green plant, and if every green plant was for the beast, you would think that the humans 
could eat it true. But regardless of the interpretation, Adam and Eve were definitely vegetarians. Everything in the Garden of Eden was vegetarians. This means that if tigers were in the Garden of Eden, yes, they would be eat something like soy burgers. But of course, Adam and Eve was cast out of the Garden of Eden, and they were cast into a sinful world. But they were still charged with living with as little sin as possible. And so they wanted to be smart about the food they eat. Uh, the food's going to have some sin in it. Everything's sinful in a sinful world. But they wanted the diet to be as close to a sinless diet as possible. They wanted to be as close to the Garden of Eden diet as possible. So, so this is how they thought. They said, well, if we eat things like cows, cows are vegetarians. So eating a cow only causes one death, the cow, if we're excluding the plants. But if you eat, say, a wolf, well, a wolf ate a cow or other things. So when you kill the wolf to eat it, there's a lot of other killings associated with that wolf. So you're further from a vegetarian diet than if you just eat, say, herbivores. So a lot of the kosher rules historians think came out of this belief that, well, we can't really be vegetarians like we were in the Garden of Eden. Let's at least eat vegetarian animals only. Now, of course, today, meat is fine for Christians. Uh, the justification is a variety of reasons. Some justify it by uh, revelation to St. Paul in the book of Acts. Uh, but, but I would also like to add that by the Middle Ages, meat became associated with Christianity. During the medieval inquisition, the Catholic Church was going out and trying to squash heresies that, that emerged. And some of these heretic clans, they didn't believe in marriage, they didn't believe in having children, and they didn't believe in eating meat. So when the church went out and looked for heretics, they looked for, pe for adults who were not married, who was not having children, and who was not eating meat. And I've got a, I've got a quote. This is from a, a man who was trying to defend himself and to prove to the Catholic Church that he was not a heretic. This is what he said. He said, I am not a heretic. I have a wife whom I love. I have children. I eat meat. So meat is definitely associated with Christianity now. Well, think of the Eastern religions. And when we think of Eastern religions, we think of karma. We think of reincarnation. We think of a world without a beginning or end. And let me read you a quote from the current Dalai Lama. This is from his 2001 book, An Open Heart. Each dog, cat, fish, fly, and human being has at some point in the beginningless past been our mother and shown us love and kindness. Such a thought should bring about our appreciation. Well, if any animal was your mother, father, best friend at some point in the past, then you're probably more reticent to eat that animal. And that... Uh, that probably explains where a lot of the um, Buddhist views on vegetarians, espousing vegetarianism, comes from. What I find interesting is that many cultures believe that gods and humans eat the same thing. Ancient Sumerians believed that when, at first the gods had domesticated animals and plants that they got the food from, and humans ate only grass and water. But the gods could never grow enough food to satisfy themselves, so they needed help growing food. So the legend says that the gods then came to humans and said, Here, we're going to give you domesticated animals. We're going to give you domesticated plants. You can now grow these foods for yourself, but make sure you grow some for us as well. And that's where the, human, not, that's where the sacrifices of foods began. And only then, when humans were growing food for the gods, were the gods ever satisfied. That's only when they got a sufficient amount where they were now full. This is for my homies. The first religions were probably ancestor worship. And some of the rituals probably involved remembering your ancestors and as you eat, sacrifice some of the food. Put the food to the side. That's for the ancestors to eat. And in many ways, and that's called a libation, when you take food that you, or drink that you could eat and you don't let anybody eat or drink it and you set aside for the gods, that's a libation. And in many ways, the tradition of libation is still alive 
today, especially in Africa. When President Obama went back to Kenya to visit some of his relatives for the first time, when he sat down at a table with them, and they were in an apartment, they, uh, at least one of the persons, took food from the plate and dropped it on the floor. Now, whether they intended that to be an ancestor or a god to eat, or whether it was just tradition, I don't know. But that was definitely a libation. And if you think about it, libations are still alive in African American culture today. Rappers often have phrases like, this is for my homies, where you take a 40 ounce bottle of malt liquor and you pour it on the ground. And that's like for dead homies, your, your friends who have died. It's in memory of them. But that's a libation. I want to show you an excerpt from GRS's 1993 rap song, rap and video song called Gangsta Lean. So the sacrifice of food and drink to gods and ancestors is widely practiced even if some of the people doing it don't necessarily believe or even understand exactly where it comes from. Now here's some logic that might help explain libations. If you are what you eat and humans are to exist after they are dead, for them to be the same entity in the afterlife, the man and spirit must consume the same food and drinks. Now yes, this is taking the phrase you are what you eat to absurd links, but taking things to absurd links is what humans definitely do best. Tell me what you eat and I'll tell you who you are. Consider a phrase slightly different than you are what you eat. It was written in 1825 by a gastronomist writer. Um, I, he's French. I don't want to pronounce his name. But his phrase was, tell me what you eat and I'll tell you who you are. This speaks volumes about the role of food as part of individuals and society's identity. Jonathan Haidt is a social psychologist. And in one of his books, he made this statement. He said, Liberals sometimes say that religious conservatives are sexual prudes, but conservatives can just as well make fun of liberal struggles to choose a balanced breakfast among moral concerns about free-range eggs, fair trade coffee, naturalness, and a variety of toxins, some of which, such as genetically modified corn and soybeans, pose a greater threat spiritually than biologically. So he's there talking about liberals and conservatives in modern America today. And that quote was made somewhat humor. Height has said he identifies himself a little more with liberals than conservatives. Now, I showed that quote to a liberal friend of mine, and he replied with this. I thought this was great. He said, and conservatives don't care what they put in their bodies as long as it's quick, convenient, and cheap. Those two you know, quotes, I think, says volumes about some of the food controversies today. Later on, we, we will come back to those quotes, but for now, I want to I stay in the ancient world. Ancient Greeks and Romans took pride in being civilized, and part of being civilized was agriculture. And a lot of their diet, well most of it, came from grains rather than the form of bread or gruel, something like that. And in fact, 80% of the calories consumed by the Greeks came from grain. And as the Greeks established colonies around the Mediterranean, like frogs around a pond, Plato once said, they would always bring with them their wheat, their vines, and their olives. I don't know how much meat Caesar ate, but his soldiers did not eat much eat. The main food of Roman soldiers was bread. And when the Romans would try to talk about what makes them a superior culture, a superior army, they would often live... Uh, they would often list their reliance on bread as a food among them. Now later, when German tribes from the north, like the Franks, the Goths, and the Vandals, came down from the north and took over the, the lower part of Western Europe, smashed the western part of the Roman Empire, you might say, they brought their culture of meat with them. The German barbarians, they loved to hunt and they really loved to eat meat. To, to a German barbarian, as the Romans would say, they thought that you proved your manhood by 
by drinking lots of beer, by doing lots of hunting and in eating, eating enormous amounts of meat. So when they came down and smashed the western part of the Roman Empire, they brought their love of meat with them. It was adopted in Western Europe and of course exported to America where it was even you know, taken up to a higher level. Reveal your greatness from the food you serve. Today, food is a political issue. And in the past, people didn't have much political rights. So it couldn't really serve as a political issue that much back then. But food did serve as a way of signifying different social classes. The nobles, the clergy, and the peasants, they could all be separated by the percent of their food that they spent on things like breads and grain. Anything that came from grains, breads or gruel. And you know, when Jesus said, man cannot live off bread alone, the reason that statement is profound is because bread was one of the main sources of food. And saying you can't live off bread alone was like saying you cannot just rely on earthly food to live a good life. And if you were higher up in the social classes, you wanted to project your stature by having feasts. And you would want to make sure you had the exact right foods out. You know, if we have breads there, they're not regular bread. They're pastries with lots of sugar and fats in them. You want to have lots of meat. You would want to be careful about the order in which those dishes were served and how they were presented. Some people would even hire consultants to make sure that they did everything about the feast just right. And there would be lots of bird meat. If you really wanted to show the world that you were high class, you would especially serve bird meat. So what's so great about birds? You may find it surprising that bird was considered a, a, a better, higher class food than, say, beef in the ancient and, and medieval world. And that's because today, chicken is, is a cheaper food. You, some might call it a poor man's food. Let me read you a quote. This is from someone in 1970 National Geographic article, and he's talking about 20 years ago. So he was talking about 1950. He said, 20 years ago, broilers sold for 65 cents a pound, and fried chicken was a treat for Sunday dinner. Now, chicken is cheaper than, ha than hamburger. So, in the past, people only ate chicken rarely because it was more expensive. But in the medieval world, there was also another reason chicken and fowl meat was reserved for people of higher class. And it has to do with this thing called the great chain of being. The great chain of being. People thought about, in the medieval world, and the... Uh, high and late middle ages as all of earth everything living coming from essentially four different elements earth water air and fire and from that they created this thing called a great chain of being that showed lower life forms and higher life forms and it started like this so remember the four things everything's made of earth water air and fire earth being the lowest water air and fire being the highest form. And so things, foods that was taken from the earth, like onions and carrots, that was the lowest form of food because it was from the earth. Then if you had a plant that was attached to the earth, but the part you eat emerged from the ground, well, that would be a higher class of form food. So lettuce would be a higher form of food than carrots. And of course, if you had an apple tree and you had to reach up and grab the apple, that's even higher off the ground. So apples would be a higher form of food than lettuce, lettuce higher than carrots. Remember, after earth comes water. So anything that lives in the water is superior to anything that is attached to the earth. So fish is a higher form of food than apples, lettuce, and carrots. And then, of course, you have air. Anything that walked on the ground, and so it was above the ground and above the water, that was even higher. And so there you have pigs and cattle. Their meat was a higher form of food. It was higher on the great chain of being than fish or apples or lettuce or carrots. And, and of course, to get even higher, you'd have to fly. And that's one reason why birds were considered such a high form of food for the high class, for the nobility, because they flew in the air. 
And by the way, there was something higher than the birds, uh, but it was a fictitious being like the, the phoenix. So, so I'm ignoring them. So what this means is that if you were a rich noble person, you would want to eat mostly foods from that, f the higher part on the great chain of being. Birds, meat, fruits, that kind of thing. And if you were peasants, it was more appropriate because you were a lower class to eat more foods from the lower part of the great chain of being. And that's one reason why food served to distinguish different social classes in the past. Eat according to your class. People took this great chain of being things very seriously. It wasn't just that only rich people had the money to consume things higher on the great chain of being. It was because it was considered more appropriate for them to eat those foods. And there was even, like in Renaissance Italy, there was even laws, these were called sumptuary laws, about who can eat what, and had a lot to do with this great chain of being. It meant only the nobles could eat certain foods. And there were even rules about how this food was served, how it was presented, even the order of the dishes. Because they wanted to make sure you could clearly tell who the nobles and the peasants were. It was even against the law for a noble to eat like a peasant. You know, People also thought it morally right for their leaders to consume foods higher on the great chain of being, meats and especially birds. And, you know, if, if you were, say, a, a resident, a citizen of Florence in, say, Renaissance Italy, you wanted to make sure the leader of Florence had good power. His power was secure. Because if a leader looks weak, they may be a coup, they may be a civil war, they may be a, a lot of killings, they may be in rest. That's dangerous. But if your leader was secure in a spot, then you knew everything was stable, everything was safe. And one way to tell whether a leader was secure is if he gorged himself on food. That's the way that they show greatness. So you wanted your leaders to gorge on food, have big feasts, to eat lots of birds because that meant you were safe. And you know, the Carolingian Empire, built by Charlemagne in the 8th and 9th centuries, it came to an end with the rejection of someone called Guido. And I want, I want you to listen to this quote by an archbishop about why they rejected him. This archbishop said, No one who is content with a modest meal can reign over us. Think about that. If you're a man and, and you eat a modest meal, you're not man enough to rule over him. Doctors would even prescribe different diets based on the person's social class. So if you were a rich noble, the doctor would say, well, for you to heal, you should eat lots of meat. That's appropriate for you. But you would prescribe a different diet for a peasant. You know, it's kind of like cows and horses eat similar things but not identical. You don't have horses eating salad, for instance. In the same way, a, a noble and a peasant would not eat they would eat similar things, but not the exact same things. It was appropriate for them to eat different things. There was even a famous Italian saying that goes, He who is used to turnips must not eat meat pies. Now, food differed by social class, not just because of different people's wealth, but it was thought in order of providence. People believed you are what you ate, that if you ate higher on the great chain of being, you would become a higher class person yourself. So they did believe that the noble was great because he ate great food. That would make it sound like if you were a peasant, you could become great. You could become a noble just by eating, say, fowl, chicken, duck. But that's not the case because providence decides what you should eat and what you shouldn't. If you're a peasant, if you were born into a peasant household, Providence said you are a peasant and therefore you are supposed to eat things like carrots and, and turnips and things like that. So you are what you eat still held true but you did not to get to decide what you ate. That was up to the fates. Take your earthly world and shove it. So food in the world of culture 
helps to establish kind of the earthly order, the, the way the, 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 the society works. And if you want to reject that world, you reject those rules about food. So if you want to reject the world and go in a monastery, it wouldn't be surprising if you also rejected meat or if the monastery did not allow meat. And often the church would even want to get everybody else to follow its more austere diet by having ritual fasting, Lent, and, and other various holidays. Insulting the meat. Meat doesn't have to just separate people from lower and higher classes. It can also serve to enforce equality within a society. And I'm going to use an example. This is one of my favorite examples. It's from the bands of Dobi in the Kahali de Desert. And this is something, and these are hunter-gatherers, people who still hunt and gather for food, live in very similar to how we think people lived 20,000 years ago. And... Although they are hunter and gatherers, they especially value meat, but it only constitutes 30% of their diet. And the, the way the society works, the women go out and, and gather seeds and vegetables and things, and the men go out to hunt meat. And sometimes the men will be gone for days. They may come back four days later, exhausted, with all the giraffe meat that they can possibly carry. And the women definitely want the meat. The, the society loves meat. And they are grateful to the men. And you would think that they would act grateful to the men when they came back. Say, great, thank you, thank you so much, I can't wait to eat this, you did great. That's the opposite of what? They do. They do a thing called insulting the meat, where when they get the meat, regardless of the actual quantity or quality of meat, they'll say things like, well, this isn't enough to feed everybody. Look at this. This is way too fatty. This meat's tough. They insult the meat as a way of saying to the hunter, yes, you did good. You did your part in this society. You did great. But you're no better than anyone else. You're just one of us. So yeah, you're bringing me something great, but I'm going to debase. I'm going to insult this meat to make sure you stay in your place. So, you know, it's almost like the Dobie understand exactly how food can be used to separate people according to different classes. And they swing far in the other direction to make sure it doesn't. Tell me how you eat and I'll tell you who you are. We've considered the phrase, you are what you eat, as well as the phrase, show me what you eat and I'll tell you who you are. We could also add the phrase, show me how you eat and I'll tell you who you are. Plutarch once wrote, once wrote we do not sit at the table only to eat but to eat together. And how you eat says worlds about the social relationships between those people. We've all heard of King Arthur and his round table and how the round table was used to show equality. Everyone is equal. It was in, in stark contrast to what would happen if you went and eat, ate with the king. You know, at, at the king of England would have a very long rectangular table on purpose because the king would be at the head and the king would show you exactly how important you are to him by how close you sit to him at that table. So the rectangular table is made to show and enforce inequality. A round table would show equality. And But the King Arthur tales are probably fiction. Now, I think the only thing we know about King Arthur is that he may have actually existed. But there are some Muslim eating traditions where you don't sit at a table but you sit on the ground and you sit in a circle. And that's a way of showing that everybody is equal. Now eating etiquette always existed in Europe even up till the 17th century France. But a 17th century France where etiquette really took off. <clears throat> And this is because before the 17th century, if you were rich noble and you wanted to distinguish yourself from peasants, you would go out and you would buy lots of spices for your food because spices were expensive. And they, they ate foods with much more uh, larger amounts of different spices like sugar and cinnamon than we do today because it was a way of conspicuous consumption. It was a way of boasting. But around 17th century, the cost of getting spices started to lower a lot because of, um, you know, ju ju just better trade routes between the Portuguese and the Spanish. Things got to, say, England and France easier, and so spices were uh, less expensive. And that meant even the poor people might 
use sugar or cinnamon occasionally, m maybe even a lot. So if you're a rich noble, you can no longer distinguish yourself from your spices. So if you can't distinguish yourself from what you eat, you distinguish yourself from how you eat. And during the court of Louis the Fourteenth, what they did was they said, okay, we can't just use spices to differentiate ourselves anymore. So we'll have these very Byzantine set of rules about how you should eat. Lots and lots of rules. Things you can only learn if you are at the court itself or if you were rich enough to hire a tutor to come in and, and show you all these rules. So you had to be close to the king to learn these rules. That's something a poor person certainly could not do. That's where a lot of these eating etiquette came from. And it, it really spread. It spread to Russia, to England, and it's still with us today. And it was the 17th century France where people really started using napkins to wipe their hands instead of the tablecloth. And that's when people also really started using forks. So, so show me how one ate 200 years ago and I'll tell you whether they were nobility or not. You can't make this stuff up. This is one of my favorite examples to talk about. It has to do with ancient Greece and the Dionysian cult. The Di Dionysus was the god of many things like wine, ritual, madness, ecstasy. And so the cult of Dionysus wanted to get as close to Dionysus as possible to earn his favor. And so they wanted to drink Dionysus, to eat Dionysus. And this is how they would do that. To drink Dionysus, they would drink wine. Because remember, Dionysus is the god of wine. But to eat Dionysus, they would gather together. I don't know how often they did this. It may have just been once a year. But they would bring in a live animal. And the cult would pounce upon that live animal and tear it apart and eat its flesh while it was still Dying. You know, if you think about, you've seen the, the wildlife videos, National Geographic, about the lions going out and, and they take down a zebra and they start consuming the zebra as the zebra is still struggling to live, still struggling to get up. That's what the Dionysus cult did with these live animals. And now listen to this part of the scripture from the Dionysus cult. It says, he who will not eat of my body and drink of my blood will not be made one with me or I with him. And he shall not know salvation. That verse probably sounds familiar to many Christians. The idea of food being the substance of a God and being able to consume a God is, is nothing new. I don't know of any modern equivalent to Dionysus. Only that I do know two instances where people eat the, the warm flesh of an animal recently slaughtered. In Ethiopia, they'll say, take a goat, slaughter it, and immediately after slaughter, take the meat, grind it up, and eat it raw while it's still warm. No refrigeration, no, you know, no treating or anything. And there's at least one African tribe who, after they shoot an elephant while its body's still warm, I don't know if they have to cut a hole, if they could just reach inside somehow, but they would go through the ear, get part of the elephant's brain, and eat it raw. Like I said, you can't make this stuff up, but it is true. Whether we look back a century or a millennium, it's obvious that food serves complex roles in society and in culture. Nothing, very little has changed about the nutrition we need from food. We all need the same nutrition from food, whether you're ancient Greek or modern American. But the role of food in society, in our culture, it has certainly changed in every different time period, every different region. And it's very flexible. So while we still need the same nutrients from food, our needs from food in terms of our culture has changed considerably. And in the next lecture, we're going to go towards America and look specifically at the role of meat in America.